Tá bom para chegar o palestrante da transmissão. Ah, tá, ah, tá bom. Não, tem que ser isso que manda. Ah, tá bom. Não, tem que ser isso que manda. Não, assim, assim, tá bom, né? O Raiz tinha pedido para fechar por causa das imagens. Se a hora que for mostrar as imagens, fica. Mas eu vou fazer uma boa. Ah, você já, você já checou? Não, eu não chequei, mas eles usam umas coisas mais definidas. Eles já pagam na hora. É, se for o caso, você vai. Aqui na transmissão não vai influenciar nesse caso, só vai ficar um pouco mais escuro a câmera dele. É, vai ser transmitido. Nesse momento, o mais importante é o que ele está mostrando. Eu só, queria, só queria dar o horário. Sim. Agora deu. Agora já iniciei a transmissão. Está com uma tela. Uma tela já já iniciaremos em instante. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with Professor uh, Hangayan from Canada. And I'm going, well, I, uh, I already sent to you all the, the small feature, but I'm going just to, to point out some highlights. Professor uh, Hangaraj Hangayan is a is professor emeritus of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Calgary in Calgary, Canada. Uh, he's, he has a long career in, and a very su su successful career in academy and in industry too. And his, his re research interests are in digital signal and image processing biomedical signal and signal analysis and computer aided diagnosis. He has published more than 170 papers in journals and 270 papers in proceedings of conference. And he has a Google Scholar age index over 60. Um, he has supervised several graduate, gra graduate students and he has Two wonderful textbooks, uh, Biomedical Signal Analysis, published by IEEE Wheeling, and Biomedical Image Analysis, published by CRC. Uh, Professor Hangayan research uh, has been featured in many newsletters, magazines, and newspapers, as well as in several radio and television interviews. Uh, he has been recognized as a distinguished lecturer by the IEEE Engineering in Medicine and the Biology Society, the University of Toronto, and the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers. He has uh, received several of our awards as well. So now we have the opportunity to listen from Professor Hangayan directly, and it's a pleasure having you here in Just Hatch. So uh, this is our time now. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. Boa tarde, good afternoon. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here again in San Carlos. I thank uh, Professor Paulo from USP Ribeirão Preto for uh, arranging my visit along with his colleague, Professor Marcelo. And uh, here I thank uh, Professor Agma and Professor Caetano for inviting me. I've come here a few times before and given a few seminars. Uh, you have a beautiful campus. It's nice to be here in Calgary. It is snowing now. It is, winter is beginning. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, today I will give a general talk 
about fractals, a general introduction to fractals with a few examples of application to biomedical signal and image analysis. The biomedical applications I'll talk about are from our work in Calgary with my graduate students and collaborators. Uh, fractal theory, well, that's well known. As the picture you saw of uh, was it broccoli or broccolini, a fractal picture in the announcement uh, of the seminar. So I'm with the University of Calgary. I retired a few years ago. So I'm Professor Emeritus of Electrical and Computer Engineering and a visiting professor here with OSPI. So it's nice to be here in Brazil again. Fractals are intriguing, interesting, and entertaining patterns in when you simulate them on computers, you can co keep going to infinite resolution, but in practice, in real life, fractals have some limited resolution and limited number of scales, but still there are many beautiful and interesting patterns that you encounter in biology and in physiology in our bodies that have fractal characteristics to a certain extent. So let's start with this uh, very simple example here. I took this fern leaf from our garden. So you see a certain pattern when you look at the entire fern leaf. And then when you look at one of these subunits, you see the same pattern. The same branching pattern that you see is present here. And when you take one of these sub patterns, you see the same pattern. So the that pattern that you see exists at at least three scales. The first scale is the full fern leaf. Second is this part. Third is the small part. And it is there further, but then there's a limit that it is made of physical material. So you cannot go any further beyond three scales. Even if I were to draw something, because the size of the chalk it's about two, three millimeters. I cannot make a scale less than three millimeters. So I can draw big patterns. And when I come to small scale, the details cannot be illustrated anymore. But on a computer, you can keep zooming and zooming and keep going in for infinite number of scales. But that is simulated. It's not real. So we have to bear in mind the distinction between simulated patterns and real life patterns. There are different definitions. Can you hear me at the back here? Okay. Okay. There are many definitions of fractals and many models that describe the generation of fractal patterns. And I'll go through three or four of them. And there are many methods to estimate the fractal dimension also in image processing and signal processing. And we will go through a few and we will see examples of application. The most common definition is that of self-similarity at multiple scales. There is a pattern that repeats in a manner similar to itself at multiple scales. As I said, this whole leaf, fern leaf has a certain pattern. The same pattern comes here and the same pattern exists there. So that is self-similarity. In the case of medical images, there are patterns that are referred to as macrolobulated versus microlobulated contours of masses and tumors, such as in the breast as seen in the mammogram or in other parts of the body. Tumors exhibit such characteristics. I'll show examples. There is another pattern that is referred to as a nested pattern or complexity, a pattern that is nested in itself. So within a pattern, there is another pattern. Within that, there is another pattern. So this kind of nesting is a certain kind of complexity of shape. So you can also consider complex shapes to exhibit some kind of fractal behavior. For that, you have to make some measurements and estimate the dimension, and then you can come to a conclusion as to whether it is a fractal or not. In 
medical images, there are smooth versus rough contours. As the contour becomes rougher and rougher, you can start with a circle, smooth. Then there are some variations and more and more and more. As it becomes more and more rough, you can say, well, there is some kind of a fractal behavior. Convex versus speculated contours. And then geometric versus space filling curves. I'll give you examples all of these, for all of these and then explain if needed. Sorry, uh, jump too much. In the human body, there are some examples of fractals. The tree pattern of the bronchial tubes in the lungs. We have the main tube here, the airway tube, and then it branches left and right. And these, those branches branch further and further and further. And there is a pattern that is referred to as a tree pattern. Similarly, the vessels in the kidney, for example, blood vessels, they also start with a major vessel that branches and each branch will branch further and further and further and so on. So branching networks of blood vessels in the body, in various parts of the body, in particular in the kidneys. The his a conducting system in the ventricles of the heart. The ventricles of the heart, the lower chambers, have to contract rapidly. The upper chambers, the atria, contract slowly and squeeze the blood slowly because the blood has to just go from the upper chambers to the lower chambers. But when the lower chambers pump, the blood has to go to the whole body. So they pump rapidly, they squeeze rapidly. And for that, the myocytes must be discharged or excited immediately over the entire volume of the ventricles. So there is a specialized conduction system where again we have the main conduction path, like electrical wires, they branch and they branch and they branch and they branch. So that is called the his Purkinjic system in the ventricles, not in the atria, but only in the ventricles. And then the convoluting pattern of the pores in the brain. So the brain pattern folds upon itself to facilitate connectivity between neurons. So these are some examples of fractals in the human body. Now you may not be able to see all of them in such detail in medical images. So you may need to section the part of the body and then you can see the details. Branching parts of the bronchial tubes can be seen in computer tomography images. The fractal dimension is a measure of fractality or fractal property. Benoit Mandelbrot in 1967 came up with this definition of self-similarity and fractal dimensions in plural. Many different types of fractal dimensions, many different estimates, many different models of synthesis and measurement. Fractal dimension quantifies complexity of the object. Could be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. As a ratio of the change in detail, like in the fern leaf I showed, to change in scale from big scale to small scale to small and small and small. For geometric shapes, such as a circle, square, the fractal dimension is equal to the Euclidean or topological dimension. If it is a line, straight line, dimension is one and that's all. For a two dimensional surface like this board, it is two, no questions. If it is a 3D volume like a sphere, three, no problem. But for fractals, the theoretical fractal dimension is greater than its topological dimension. So if I draw a complex or complicated line, so instead of drawing a straight line, if I draw a line that is, oh, sorry, like this, can you see that? This, there's no doubt, is one-dimensional, but what is this? It is a one-dimensional line, but it is spread in two dimensions. It is occupying two dimensions in some way. So this is a kind of a fractal. I could say it is a fractal. Is there self-similarity? I can draw something like that, a triangle, triangular shape. And on each of these, I can draw another triangle and make the triangle smaller and smaller. 
if it is a signal, it has to go only in one direction. It cannot reverse a function of time. So then I can have this kind of complexity. But then the fractal dimension is more than one tending towards two. So a one dimensional pattern that becomes complex with some kind of a pattern that is repeating, it is uh, somehow nested in complexity can be seen to be a fractal. And its fractal dimension is more than one. Even this 1D signal or line is being drawn on a two dimensional plane, but it's a function of one dimension. But here it is somehow filling the space in a different way. And the same for two dimensional and three dimensional objects. The cauliflower is a good example of fractal in nature. I took this cauliflower in our kitchen, and if you were to take one of the florets and zoom, it looks like a cauliflower, a full cauliflower. And if you take another piece of that, a floret from there and zoom, it looks like a cauliflower, but there's a limit. So I took one piece, one floret, and if I zoom, uh, I don't know if I can zoom it, but anyway, you can imagine. Zoom it and it will look like a full cauliflower. And if I zoom that, yes. If I zoom this and that, maybe not. The detail is lost. Especially the last piece, if I zoom, I can't see any more detail. If I cut any further, then I must use it in cooking. I cannot see any fractal pattern anymore. But certainly one, two, three, maybe four scales of a real object. Because every part has to have some physical dimension, it cannot go to the millimeter, micrometer level of detail. There are some popular examples. Let me see if I can take the mouse away. There are some popular examples. One of them is called the Cantor bar. And the Cantor bar, the rule to prepare this is draw a straight line and then cut it into three parts, remove the middle part. So this is scale one. This is the starting point zero. And then take each part and repeat. Divide into three parts, remove the middle part. And divide this into three parts and remove the middle part. This is already gone. And take this and do that and keep doing it. So similarly, if I were to do this by hand, if I take, if my line is like that, and I remove into three parts, then I can do this maybe. If I take that and try to break into three parts, I cannot do with this chalk. Okay? So there is a limit to do it by physical means. It's jumping twice for some reason. Okay. The Sierpinski triangle is an interesting example again. A triangle now and uh, equilateral triangle. You mark the middle point here and join the centers of the line of the edges of the triangle and take that middle piece out. And of what is remaining, the black is what is remaining, white is thrown out. You repeat and repeat, you get that pattern. So that's another fractal that is popular and well known. There are several, several definitions of fractal dimension. A classic definition based on self-similarity, which is what we started with. Self-similarity, triangle, 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 smaller and smaller triangles, they're all triangles. So it is similar in multiple scales. If A is the number of self-similar pieces and 1 over S is the reduction factor or scale factor and D is the self-similarity dimension, A is equal to 1 over S to the power of D. So take the log. D is log A over log 1 over S. So if you can measure the number of self-similar pieces for various scales and plot log A over log 1 over S, you can estimate the fractal dimension as the slope of this curve. I'll show some examples in a little while. 
The box counting method is one of the commonly used techniques. When you have a pattern like this, this is the contour of a malignant tumor due to breast cancer in a mammogram. Very rough contour. If you want to estimate the fractal dimension of that, the box counting method says uh, plot it on some sheet of paper or some grid and then divide that into boxes of some size, one centimeter or 10 pixels or 100 pixels, whatever. The number of boxes and count the number of boxes in which the pattern exists, the yellow boxes. The other boxes, you don't count. And then make the box smaller. And now more of the boxes are filled. Now even smaller and count the number of boxes. And plot the number of boxes against number of the scale, the size of this grid element. And then on a log log scale, and you can estimate the box counting method. Or estimate the fractal dimension. The cock snowflake has a theoretical fractal dimension of 1.262 using that formula. It's again based on a triangle. You start with a triangle for each side, fit another triangle in the middle, remove one third of this and draw a triangle like I tried to do it here. And take each of these lines, now break that into another triangle and so on. So keep repeating and the pattern becomes more and more complex. The length of the contour increases the perimeter. It's based on triangles, so you can see all the triangles here, and if you zoom in, you can see triangles. So this is, again, a self-similar pattern where triangles exist at multiple scales, and using the box counting method, the log of the number of uh, boxes versus log of one over scale we get all these points of observation. And to, that, you, to all those points, you fit a straight line. So this was actually done uh, on the computer. So it's not a perfect straight line, but you fit a straight line and we got 1.264, which is similar to or very close to 1.262, the theoretical dimension. So the box counting method is one technique. I'm missing some. This is jumping to. Okay. Um, another example is a space filling curve. Like I said here, this is filling. Instead of just going in one direction, it is going in two directions and filling the space given. There are some ordered space filling curves that have a repeating pattern at multiple scales. So you could call them fractals because they meet some of the conditions of fractals. Is it a fractal according to those other definitions looking at the cauliflower and uh, Sierpinski triangle? It doesn't look like that. The piano hilford curve is an example of a space filling curve. As computer scientists, I think you'll be interested in that. We used it to scan images and we got some interesting results. So this is uh, a grid, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then eight more, 16 by 16 dots, pixels, if you want to call them. So the condition is you must visit all the six, 16 by 16, 256 pixels without crossing, without returning, your path should not cross itself. And you must visit neighboring points first. From here, you must visit this and not go farther, but visit the one that is nearest and the nearest and so on. In raster scanning, you go straight like that. You visit all these pixels and then come back and take this next line and come back. And so this pixel will be separated by all of those pixels and then you come here. So you'll be visiting the adjacent pixel in the vertical direction after visiting all the horizontal pixels in raster scanning, which is the old type of television line scanning. So before you visit this point from here, you have already visited all of the others. So that raster scanning method does not maintain 
correlation. This is correlated more with this pixel. This is correlated, but that and this are not correlated, even in a rough image. But in the raster scan signal, this and this will come side by side. So there is a jump. Now with digital television, we don't have that problem. Previously, the analog signal, the two-dimensional image was converted to a one-dimensional signal for transmission. In the old analog TV, many of you don't even know what analog TV is. You just get all the pixels sent to you. But in piano scanning, what it says is, if you have an image that has 16 by 16 pixels, and you are asked to read all of them, the condition is your path should not cross again. You cannot visit the same pixel again. And you must visit all pixels that are in a spatial neighborhood first before going into the next neighborhood. So the image is broken into sub-blocks. If you look at this block, the scanning pattern is one from this pixel, next pixel, this, this. And the next path is come here, like this, like that, like that. One, two, three, four. It's like a U, like a paper clip. So the basic scanning pattern is like that, or like this, or like that, or like this. Reflected versions of you for four pixels. Now the same thing happens when you go from one scale to another. After this, you visit this and here and go. So that is a you. And then you come here and you visit this and that and that and that. That's a you like that. So this pattern repeats at multiple scales when you scan the image. The advantage, as I said, is you visit all these pixels in a small neighborhood before you go to the next bunch of pixels. So when you put all those pixels in a straight line, the signal will be smooth because all the pixels are correlated. It won't have large jumps. Depends on what is present in the image, but the pixel values are correlated. Let me go there. In case I missed anything, I do all of that. Okay, good. Jumping too much. Okay. In mammograms, which are X ray images of the breast, the radiologist interpreting the mammogram looks for masses, tumors, calcifications, and other signs of breast disease. Benign masses are higher density tissue uh, collection, like nodules, not caused by breast cancer, but some other breast disease. So benign means not cancer. They're usually round or oval in shape, smooth shape. Sometimes they may be macrolobulated. So what macrolobulated means is that instead of being round, suppose I break this into three parts and I make that a lobule. Yes. Yes. So there are three lobules and the lobules are big. If I make the lobules very small, then it would be called microlobulated. If I start with that triangle, there are no triangle or objects in the body, but if I draw these spicules, and then I take this and draw that and draw that and draw that. So then the contour becomes more and more spiculated, meaning finger-like protrusions, becomes more and more complex. So such patterns are observed in breast tumors due to malignant disease or cancer. They are spiculated, they are rough contours, they are microlobulated in 3D, but in a mammogram you see only in two dimensions. The density inside the tumor is heterogeneous, variations in density of the tissue. The boundary is ill-defined and ill-circumscribed or blurry. 
Whereas in the case of benign masses, the density inside the mass is homogeneous, almost the same density, smooth. The contour is sharp. Inside to outside, the gradient is high because the mass is encapsulated in a certain way. So they are said to be well-defined, well-circumscribed and sharp, whereas here malignant, ill-defined, ill-circumscribed, blurry. The fractal pattern comes here in being microlobulated and speculated. Macrolobules, this is also a fractal, but they are big lobules. The idea is the same. From here, if I repeat the lobulation, I'll get that. Like a cloud. You can start with a sphere, break it into a few lobules, and break and break, and even a mountain. From a distance, it look, looks like a triangle. A mountain may look like a triangle, but when you go closer, uh, it has a lot of detail in three dimensions. So here are some examples. Benign mass, part of a mammogram, where inside the mass it is fairly uniform density, the edge is sharp, the contour drawn by a radiologist is almost a perfect circle. This is benign, macrolobulated, like a group, one, two, three lobules. My malignant, microlobulated, little lobules, speculated. The contours again, another set of examples. This is well circumscribed and benign, tested by biopsy. This is speculated benign. Sometimes benign masses also have spicules. Sometimes the malignant masses may not have spicules, but have little lobules sometimes. Typically, Malignant tumors are speculated. And typically, benign masses are well circumscribed and have smooth contours. So that is a kind of a fractal behavior, as I have tried to explain here. There is another method called the ruler method, which is also commonly used and commonly given as an example of measuring fractal property. So let u be the length of uh, a contour measured with a ruler of size S. And for a fractal contour, the total length that you measure, U is proportional to one over S to the power of D. C is a proportionality constant. The fractal dimension, capital D, is one plus small d. I take the log, log U is log C, it's a constant, take it out, just an offset. D log one over S. So if you plot log U with log one over S, the slope will give you D. Add one, you get the fractal dimension. So the idea is this, if you have a, a ruler of some size, if there is a pattern, if I measure this, one, two, three, four, four times this ruler, that's the length. If I measure with a smaller ruler, I get uh, one, two, and so on. If I multiply with the scale size, the length is the same, whether I measure with small ruler or big ruler, if it is a simple geometric pattern. Whereas this, if I measure with a big ruler, I go like this, so starting from here, fine. If I go like this, I go there. Oh wait, well, I can go here, I can go here. But from here, what is the next point? I come here. And from here, the next point is there. So I'm missing this I can measure, but then I come here, I go there, and from here the next point is uh, uh, maybe there. I'm missing some details. But if I take a small ruler, I can measure all of these. But there is a limit how small your ruler can be. So if it is an island like Florianopolis, if you want to measure the contour, the boundary, the perimeter, you can start with a ruler that is like one kilometer long and then 100 meters, 10 meters, you aren't going to measure with one millimeter. So you get different lengths as the scale becomes smaller, the length becomes longer and longer. Then you plot that. So here's an example, 2D contour of a malignant tumor, big ruler, all these details are missed. You cannot put the ruler outside. It has to 
go on a point on the contour plane. So I get some distance, some length of the contour. If I use a smaller ruler, I get more details. Some details are still missed. So smaller and smaller uh, ruler, I get better and better measurement of the actual perimeter. Like the same idea, plot it, log log scale, and measure. Estimate the slope, add the constant required, and that's the fractal dimension. Now, two-dimensional patterns may be converted to one-dimensional signals by measuring some property of every point on the contour from some reference point. Uh, why do you want to do it? I'm an electrical engineer, so is Paolo. We do signal processing, mostly one dimensions, like in communication, speech, radar, sonar, functions of time. If you give a two-dimensional pattern, and we have done a lot of work on one-dimensional signal processing, the question comes, can you make that 1D signal, please? So I can do, I can apply all of my one-dimensional signal processing techniques. So the way to convert a two-dimensional pattern, which is in this case a closed loop, but could be anything, is find the center of this. I'll remove this. So it's a macrolobulated contour. Find the centroid, let's say it is this, and draw lines to every point, every pixel or every point on the boundary, and get these distances. Sorry, I'm wasting a lot of your chalk. I have not written with a chalk in many years. So measure this, these distances, and those values are given as a signal. If you go around again, you get the same thing. So you only go once. But if you repeat, you get the same. So this is a periodic signal, which gives some nice properties in signal processing. So one property you can measure is this distance from the centroid or center of mass. This is just the average of the X coordinates and Y coordinates of all the points on the contour. Measure these distances. You can do in 3D also. And in 3D, you just get a collection of points. You get the statistics. Did you have do you have a question? No. No, okay. Now I saw your hand. But in coming from 2D to 1D, we make that into a signal, like a function of time, but this is not time. So the property you're measuring is the Euclidean distance. This is x naught, y naught. But you can also take the distance against angle to sweep from 0 to 360 degrees and you get the distance as a function of angle. So then you can say it is in polar coordinates if you want. The difficulty comes when there is a very complicated pattern. If you say this is a center, if you say I'll draw lines at various angles, uh, let me see. I'll, I'll say the, the center is somewhere here. If I draw at this angle, suppose the center is there, it'll cut the contour at multiple points. So what is the distance for this angle? You may define, I'll say, I'll take the smallest or the biggest. But if it is not, like if it is speculated and the centroid is here, and I draw a line at this angle, uh, I choose some angle where it will cut multiple times, where I can go at this angle, it will cut the contour at multiple points. So instead of that, you may say I will connect to every pixel on the boundary and get a signal like this. So you go around the contour. You can get the signature as D0, D1, D2, so on. Or you can also express the X and Y coordinates of the contour points as a complex quantity, X0 plus J, Y0, J or I, square root of minus 1, convert into a complex quantity that we will call as Z, or Z, 0, Z1, Z2, Z3. And that is a complex quantity that you can do something else with. I'll show it at the end later. So this is a this is the contour of a benign mass. 
oval and the signature is this. If it is a circle, the signature is constant. The radius is the same for all the points. This is oval, so it is a sinusoid, smooth curve, almost sinusoid, so only one frequency. If I do frequency analysis using the Fourier spectrum, if I do spectrum analysis, if it is a malignant tumor, it is very rough, the signal is rough, high frequency, more high frequency. So I can characterize this using classical signal processing techniques, taking the spectrum, measuring the power in various bands, how much power in high frequency compared to low frequency, and this is rough, high frequency, fast signal. Now you can apply the ruler method here also if you want. For the ruler method, the pattern doesn't have to be a closed loop. So here again, using a long ruler, you get these points. Using a short ruler, you are measuring all these. You are still missing some details. If you use even smaller ruler, you will get that. The fractal dimension for this, according to this method. 1.15, just a little more than 1. The Euclidean dimension is 1. Fractal dimension should be between 1 and 2. But look at these points and the straight line fit. It's not a very good fit. It's not showing that pattern expected. So you could also say, no, this is not a fractal. And say, I'll just make the fractal dimension 1. But anyway. We have a method and we have a data set. We have to apply the method and put it in pattern classification. The number is small. Fractal dimension is 1.15. If I do it to the malignant one, I don't have the number here, but it may be 1.5, 1.6. So we tested this with a data set, with multiple data sets. One data set has 57 contours, 37 benign and 20 malignant, confirmed by biopsy. Another data set has 54 contours with so many varieties, but 28 benign, 26 malignant. Uh, the radiologist with whom we collaborated was not interested in circumscribed, speculated, birads, one, two, three, four. He was not interested in that. Just benign malignant. This database is from London, England. This is from our database in Calgary. We're using the fractal dimension using two two-dimensional box counting, one-dimensional box counting. You can apply the 1D box counting to the signatures also if you want. Just as an experiment, we did this. And 2D ruler, 1D ruler, this is the area under the ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic curve, as a measure of the value of this feature, fractal dimension, in distinguishing between or classifying benign versus malignant tumors in the data set. So we got good values, 0.91 with one data set, the other data set up to 0.8. When combined both, we got 0.89. So it's OK. It's not the best. But we're using only one number. In practice, you don't use one feature. You compute many attributes, 10, 20, maybe 100. There is another kind of fractal dimension or fractal signal that is referred, that arises from fractional Brownian motion. In physics, you might have heard about fractional Brownian motion of a particle that is moving at random in some space, 2D space or 3D space or 1D space. The position occupied by this particle at different times constitutes a signal. If it is along one dimension and you get a signal. The fractality of such a pattern is defined in this manner. The variance of the value of some property of this signal or this object at time t2 minus time t1, the variance of that measured for the entire signal, is proportional to t2 minus t1, the difference in the time to the power of 2h, where h is called the Hurst exponent, which is between 0 and 1. And for a self-assigned process in the n-dimensional Euclidean space, d plus h is n plus 1. So if you know h, you can compute the fractal dimension. d is a fractal dimension. So this is another way 
to synthesize fractals and analyze fractals. So we simulated or synthesized a few signals in one dimension. Uh, this is uh, with Hurst exponent 0 0.2. Fractal dimension is 1.8. N is 1. So 2 minus H. That. And estimated fractal dimension using a method that I'll describe now is 1.807. So not bad. As the Hurst exponent increases, the fractal dimension decreases. The signal becomes smoother, not as rough. So we simulated a number of signals like this using a frequency domain method. You assume the same spectrum, but make the phase random. And use this model. There is a method to incorporate the Hurst coefficient or Hurst exponent. And you get signals like this, where clearly this is more rough than that, more rough than this. By spectral analysis, that is by taking the Fourier transform of that and getting the power spectrum, the model says the power spectrum S of F, F is frequency in Hertz, if it is a function of time, is proportional to one over F to the power of beta. So such signals are called one over F signals. The power decreases linearly with frequency if it is one over F, but it could be one over F to the power of beta. And then D, the fractal dimension, is phi minus beta over 2, where beta is the slope. Log SF is 1 over log of 1 over F to the power of beta. So it is beta times log of 1 over F, which is log of minus, minus log F. So beta, the scale factor, comes out as the slope of power spectrum versus a signal on a log log scale. I'll show you that. So here are some signals. We recorded these signals from the knee joint from the patella of patients with uh, some problems with the knee joint. One condition known as chondromalacia patella, where the knee joint, the underside of the knee joint, the cartilage is lost. And when the patella rubs against the femur, when you do swinging motion or walk, this is, this is the patella and this is the femur, kneecap or the patella slides like this. If the cartilage here is lost, lubrication is lost or here, then there'll be friction. If all the cartilage is lost and bone rubs on bone, it's very painful. Time to go and get a mechanical knee joint made of titanium or stainless steel or something. It's very common nowadays. Many of my friends have both knees as artificial knees after the age of 70 or so. This is a signal from a normal subject who had some complaint and went to the orthopedic surgeon. The orthopedic surgeons with whom we collaborated said, well, we get patients saying that I have a problem. It's making so sounds, noise as I walk or do this, some <laughs> sound, and it is hurting. And then they say, OK, we do arthroscopy. To do arthroscopy, they make small incisions, put a fiber optic scope, kind of like a little television camera inside and look at this joint surfaces, cartilage, and ligaments. And in many cases, they say, there's nothing. Everything is perfect. And close and go home. Nothing to be done. Previously, they had to open the knee joint, major surgery. But for the past 20, 30 years, they have been doing 30 years, maybe, maybe 40 years. They do arthroscopy. Like uh, laparoscopic surgery, they make a small hole. They don't cut you. Sometimes they cut you, too. So they said, well, there are patients coming with this problem and complaining, but then we do this arthroscopy and everything is normal. So can we distinguish between those who should have arthroscopy and those who do not need arthroscopy by measuring something else? So we measured the signal by putting uh, transducers, accelerometers that measure the vibration here, there, and so on, three, four accelerometers. And the patient comes to the lab and sits on a bench and does this. So this is over one cycle. Stand and this. This is from a patient with uh, chondromalacia patella. Looking at them, it's a bit difficult. We call this vibroarthrographic signal. Looking at the signal is a little difficult. So we said, well, let's see if the power spectrum has some information. 
So in the log power, the log frequency, is there a range where it is almost linear? So we can fit a straight line. It is, there are lots of variations, but if you fit a straight line over a certain portion, this is one hertz, 10 hertz, 100 hertz, 1000 hertz log scale. So somewhere in the range from about 20, 30 hertz or more, maybe 30 hertz, up to about uh, 200, 300 hertz, we changed that range experimentally and checked. There is a certain range where we can fit a straight line, and it looks like a reasonable fit. And the slope of that is beta, and then you can get the fractal dimension. And using that, using only one measure of fractal dimension, we got area under the ROC curve of 0 0.75 with a set of 89 signals, which is not bad. But again, one parameter is not enough. We have to compute many parameters. When you compute more and more parameters, if each one gives you 0 0.7, 0 0.75, put them all together, you may get 0 0.9, 0 0.95, and then you're happy. But 0 0.75 is not bad for one measure only, which is fractal dimension using the 1 over F model. When you have images, there is another method to compute the fractal dimension. And that is known as the blanket method. The blanket method says, suppose you have a, a two-dimensional plane like this. You want to cover this with a sheet of cloth or a blanket. The area of the blanket required is equal to the area of this, how much ever you want to cover. Suppose from here to there, if it is smooth. Now suppose this has some roughness going up and down. It's going from 2D to 3D. But it's going up and down. Suppose it's like downtown, there are buildings in blocks. And the buildings, suppose the buildings are all stuck together, then this is a building, that is another building, this is another building. It could be one pixel. This pixel is one building, this pixel is another building. The height of that building is equal to the pixel value. So if it is smooth, all the buildings have the same height, then the area on top that you want to cover is the same as before on the ground. But if they have different heights and you have to cover or paint them, you have that block, that block, that block, plus this wall, plus that wall for every pixel. So to cover all of that in paint or in uh, cloth, you need more. So repeat this with multiple scales. The pixel size is this much. Now make the pixel size bigger or smaller, cut in quarter like this much, and repeat for different scales. But then for every scale, epsilon, the area is epsilon squared plus this part this pixel minus the next pixel, this pixel minus the next pixel, horizontal vertical. That's the difference in the area. This part, BCGH and uh, BCFE, that part. So repeat at multiple scales, plot log of area versus log of uh, the scale, epsilon, take the slope, that gives you the fractal dimension with some correction factor, scale factor, not scale, but displacement factor. So we can synthesize two dimensional patterns also using the fractional Brownian motion model with the, with the model being 2.2, model fractal dimension 2.2, we get a smooth pattern, like smooth cloud. And 2.4, a little bit more rough, like what you see in a mammogram or you see on a cloudy day, clouds, and rougher, 2.6. The blanket fractal dimension, 2.5, 2.57, 2.7, increasing, but there's a bias. 2.2, we're getting 2.5. It's okay, it's increasing. So if you do classification, it will still work. The pulse spectral analysis method, I'll show how to do 2D to 1D. It did not give good results in this case. That is the model to generate the image, pass spectral method, 1 over f to the power beta. But that method, when applied to the images, did not give good results with these synthetic images. 
To do this method, to apply this spectrum analysis method to two-dimensional images, you have to convert the two-dimensional Fourier transform to a one-dimensional Fourier transform spectrum, or spectrum. For that, compute the two-dimensional Fourier transform of the image, compute the two-dimensional pass spectral density, square the Fourier transform, transform the 2D pass spectral density in the Cartesian coordinates, UV, rectangle coordinates, to 1D path spectral density by radial averaging in the polar uh, coordinates. Fit a straight line to the selected range of frequencies on the 1D path spectral density on a log log scale, and then get the slope and 8 minus beta over 2. Gives you the fractal dimension. We applied this method to mammograms, parts of mammograms that were detected and extracted using a different technique for segmentation detect points where there, were, there was a divergence of angle of the texture. So this is one of the regions with uh, the architectural distortion pattern. Fourier transform, you don't see any pattern, but the energy is spread in all directions. From rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates, F theta, F is the radial distance, distance from the center to the point here, let's say, angle is theta. So that is the path spectrum in polar coordinates. Now if you integrate in this direction or sum, you get a function of theta, which is this. If you integrate in this direction, you get a function of f, radial frequency. So this is log of radial frequency. This is angle 0 to 180 degrees. So radial frequency spectrum computed from this has a nice linear part here. Fit a straight line. So that says, yes, there is fractal behavior here, and that slope gives you the fractal dimension. But we also said, well, this is what is done in fractal analysis, but that's not enough. We know that this angular distribution is also important. There are texture elements here with orientation, gradient orientation, at multiple angles. So the angular distribution is broad from 0 to 180 degrees. Some concentration here and there. But if I take the entropy or variance, it will be high. If I take a part of a mammogram without architectural distortion, it will be narrower. To compare the performance of uh, fractal dimension of breast tumors and masses with other well-known shape factors, we use some of the shape factors that are well-known in the literature and also some that we designed. Compactness is a very well-known shape factor, which is typically defined as perimeter square divided by area. Take the total length of the contour. Uh, like this, that is perimeter square, and compute the area inside the contour, p squared divided by a. But that is unbounded, it can go from zero to not infinity, but very large numbers. If you use this definition, one minus four pi a divided by p squared, for a circle, this is zero. And the maximum it can take, when area is very small and perimeter is very large, maximum is one. So it's an advantage when the feature is limited to the range 0 to 1, self-normalized. But this is compactness. It's a well-known feature. It works very well in many applications. Convex deficiency is another uh, technique that is also commonly known. If you have an object like this, this is a, a vertebral body that has a compression fracture, a project in collaboration with uh, Dr. Paolo Mazzoncini here and uh, Dr. Marcelo Barbosa in uh, Instead of being a convex object, which is like a square, there are concavities, distortion like this. This is convex. This is not convex because of the concavities in the bottom. Convex deficiency is computed by fitting the convex hull to this object. The convex hull is the smallest convex object that contains the human object. A convex object is one 
for which if I take two points, I draw a line, all the points on the line must be inside the object. But in this case, if I take that point and this point and draw a line, it is not, this part, the line is outside the object, this is not convex. For a square or a circle, they are convex objects, a rectangle also. So convex deficiency is the difference in the area between the convex hull and the object area and divided by the object area or the convex hull area, depending on how you want to normalize. We also defined a measure of concavity. First by fitting uh, a polygonal model by finding points of inflection. So this is the contour of a benign mass, macrolobulated, malignant tumor speculated. And these are the points of its inflection where the curvature changes. So when you have change from a convex part to a concave part of the contour, there are points of inflection. There are methods to estimate them by taking the derivatives of the x and y coordinates, first, second, third derivatives. But this is not enough. Now you fit a polygonal model by if the distance between this line and the real contour is too large, some limit, then you add an extra point. Increase the order of the polygon and keep repeating iteratively. And finally, you get a polygonal model. In this benign case, 36 lines, 36 vertices. Very good fit. In this case, malignant 146. And you can see, if you zoom, you will see there are some parts that are missed. But it's a polygonal model. Now, from this, you can get geometric characteristics. You can derive properties when you know the polygon. What we do is we take the points of inflection, and between points of inflection, we say this part is concave, that part is convex, concave, convex, concave, convex, and so on. And measure the length of the concave portions as a ratio of the total perimeter. In the benign case, these concave parts are very small. Malignant, there are many, many concave parts. When there are spicules, you get convex and concave, convex, concave, convex, concave. <laughs> so concavity, the fractal concavity is large for malignant tumors. It's very simple, but nobody had done this before. So we published a paper on that. That's all. Not a big idea, but I don't know why nobody did it before us. Dr. Desertel, the radiologist, gave us the suggestion. And then we also were told that the spicules, in the case of uh, malignant tumors, are long and have a small angle. They are long and narrow. Whereas the spicules in benign, if they exist, are big and smooth and they are short. The angle is big when you fit a polygon. So we said we will define a speculation index. This is also our own measure in collaboration with our radiologist. So for every spicule, we find an angle using the polygonal model. But for each spicule, there could be multiple sides of the polygon. So we put a condition and select the small angles and average them. We reject the big angles. Cosine of theta i. Theta i is one angle for the spicule. Si. Si is the length of the spicule using the polygonal model. Add all the sides of the polygon inside the spicule using the points of inflection to decide what is a spicule. Divide by the sum of all the spicule lengths, this is the perimeter of the contour. This worked very well, surprisingly. And uh, here's an example. The angle of this spicule is 36 degrees, very small. It is not one angle, it's the average of all the small angles, less than the average of the polygon sides of the polygon inside the spicule. It has one, two, three, four, five sides of the polygon, so four angles. We reject the large angles and take the average of the angles that are smaller than the average of all the angles. Well, this is 108 degrees. So this speculation index catches that information. This spicule is long, this spicule is short. Fourier descriptors are defined by taking this complex quantity z equal to x plus jy for every coordinate 
along the contour. And you take the Fourier transform. Zn is xn plus jyn. This is the Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform if you want, or it is also the Fourier series because if you go around the contour, you get the same thing. So it is periodic. So it is Fourier series. Zk, these are the Fourier coefficients. K is the harmonic index or frequency index. Zm times cosine and sine of this. Now, the number of values of Zk is the same as number of values of Zn, so we are not achieving any data reduction. We have a lot of data still. So we wanted to get a simple number, one number, to characterize shape complexity. You normalize the Fourier descriptors by dividing by Z1 and setting the Z0 to 0. Z0 is simply the centroid. We don't care, take it, take it down. Take the first one, Z1, and normalize. Then you normalize the Fourier descriptors to rotation and scaling. So the, scale, the shape factor now becomes invariant to shift, rotation, and scaling, which is a desirable feature. Then we said, in the case of a rough contour, there'll be more high frequency components. So we should give increasing weight and compute a moment. So normally we would have put z k times z not k divided by normalized total energy of the Fourier spectrum. But that will be sensitive to noise. So we said we will divide by k instead and take one minus that. So we call this the Fourier factor. So here are some examples, benign mass. This is microlobulated. This is speculated but benign and speculated and malignant. Uh, uh, these are malignant rather, these are benign. This is part of a mammogram. So we have a number of factors. The fractal dimension according to one of the methods, 1 1.15, 1.24, 2.756. So it is increasing as expected. Not for all the hundred of them in this case, in these examples. Compactness increasing. Speculation index. There's no speculum here, 0 0.05, 0 0.86. Uh, Fourier factor, 1 0.13 to 0.57, all increasing. Uh, fractional concavity, 0 0.03 to 0 0.5. So this is the behavior we want, the shape factors to increase with roughness, including fractal dimension. The others are for comparative analysis. So here is one data set where we ordered the contours in increasing order of one of the features from 1.05 to 1.7. We can also combine multiple features and take some weighted combination or the total, uh, like the root mean square value. If you have features F1, F2, F3, you can take square root of F1 square plus F2 square plus F3 square, or you can take some weighted combination, A1, F1 plus A2, F3 plus A3, F3 and use that to rank order. So smooth contours have low values and rough contours have big values. So you can put a threshold and say, after this, I say these are all malignant. There are some that are not going according to the expectation. So they'll be misclassified. We will never get 100%. In mathematics, I got 100% twice. I'm sure many of you got. 100% many times, but in English and sociology, no, <laughs> you will never get 100%. Another data set, this is benign. The number came to 1.04, but it is not smooth. And then 1.5 maximum in this case, very rough. So again, you have to find a threshold and say, okay, after this, we we'll call them all malignant. But this is benign, this is benign. So they're all misclassified. So it depends on the data set. Dr. Desertel said something is wrong in this data set from London. He said, these are very unlikely to be benign. Something must have gone wrong. But we take what is given in the data set. So the performance measured in terms of area under the ROC curve we have factor 0 0.77, compactness 0 0.87, and so on. Compactness, a very simple number, as I said, give good result. 
uh, fractal dimension using the ruler method on 1D signatures, 0.89. Others also give similar results. When you combine fractal dimension with fractional concavity, we got 0.93, the highest result in this case, using the two data sets combined, 111 contours. So one shape factor can complement another and take care of some of the limitations of the other. Or if you put them all together and put and do feature selection, you may select two, three, four of them. I have some more results that I won't go into detail. We had another database from our collaborators in Bari in Italy using full field digital mammograms and contours drawn by the radiologist and we put them all together, train on this data set, test on that data set, use this classifier and that classifier, and we got good results going up to 0 0.97 area under the ROC curve. So the conclusion is significant differences exist in the fractal dimension of contours of malignant tumors versus benign masses in breast tumors, as seen in mammograms. Now the tumors are in three dimensions in the breast. The mammogram is two-dimensional and we're taking the contour and we're converting that to one-dimensional signals in some cases. We can also do two-dimensional box counting. We get similar results. So there is a dimensionality reduction and some information is lost as you project a three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional plane. But anyway, we can still observe differences and this fractal dimension can serve as a useful feature in computer-aided diagnosis of breast cancer. There's not just this one. Now we have measures of texture, we have measures of roughness, of density, we have measures of uh, gradient or sharpness of the boundary. You have to put them all together. Just because this gave 0 0.97 on this database, it doesn't mean it will give you 0 0.97 on another database from Brazil or China or somewhere else characteristics could be different. So we need to have a number of features. Today we have concentrated on shape and a little bit of texture using the Fourier method to characterize fractional Brownian motion as texture and also the blanket method. But we need more. Typically you will have 100, 200 features. But this is one. Fractal analysis can also assist in the analysis of biomedical signals, such as the knee joint signal I showed, and also in EMG, the electromyogram that you get from muscles when you do some work with your muscle. As the force increases, the signal complexity increases, and you want to measure that. Well, when a patient doesn't have a limb and is using a prosthetic device and wants to send a signal from the brain to a device that will control the prosthetic device, then you must analyze the signal somehow, what is the signal telling us? Or the patient may do something in this hand and you want to translate that to action of the prosthetic device. Fractional, a fractal analysis and a fractal dimension have been, have been shown in a number of studies to be useful in the characterization of EMG or electromyographic signals also. So, These are the agencies that supported uh, my work on this, and these are my collaborators. Dr. Leo Desito is the radiologist. Uh, I don't have the names of my Italian collaborators. Uh, Lucas Figueroa Pereira came from Viveron Plato to work with us, so he did some part of the work. And I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you.
as I said, there are many different models to explain fractal behavior in different dimensions. Uh, and there are many different methods to estimate the fractal dimension also. For the same pattern, you can estimate the fractal dimension using different methods. But the models are different. Self-similarity is one definition. The fractional Brownian motion is very different. Fractional Brownian motion, as I said, could describe a particle like I'm jumping and moving around and the position of where I'm standing or an electron that is moving in a field. So that is the, in physics, you would start with that. So that behavior is fractal in a certain sense according to the Hurst coefficient equation that I gave. That's totally different from uh, self-similarity. There is a randomness involved here. Whereas in self-similarity, there is no randomness. There is a very clear rule. Uh, you take this and cut into three pieces and remove this piece. Take this and remove the middle part and two pieces and so on. That's a very geometrical and very clearly defined procedure. There is no randomness. And what I tried to draw here, uh, to draw the mountain with a triangle or the cock snowflake, that's a very clearly defined geometric pattern. And the fractal dimension can be estimated, can be, no, is given by the model to a perfect number, 1.262 something for the, that's defined geometrically. That's based on self-similarity. But if it is uh, this uh, one over F to the power of beta, that's a power spectrum with some random phase Power spectrum has some magnitude, but the phase is random. As you change the randomness, you get different signals and different spectra. So that is different. But that's a function of, it started with function of time, with electron motion or a moving particle, moving object. So there are different models. Which model will work for your data set? I don't know. Is it a function of time, space, 2D, 3D? I don't know, so it all depends on that. The blanket method says there is roughness in texture of the image. If it is flat like this, there is no texture. Texture in the sense of gray level variation of the image. If my image is uh, just a uh, square like that and all the values are equal, there is no texture. But if there is some pattern and there is variation, there is roughness then that roughness can be translated to these buildings, like downtown buildings on this plain space. So that variation in the heights of these buildings is a kind of fractal behavior. It's, it's not fractal in any other sense that I have described, any of the other senses. It is roughness. So roughness in an image in a two-dimensional plane uh, can be translated to this variation in height with the height being the pixel value. So in your case, maybe that will help. I don't know. So you need to investigate. That's a part of the investigation so that when you apply one of these methods, if it gives you the result and very good result, you can say, yes, it's fractal, it is working, but then you must explain why. What is the underlying model that says there is fractal behavior in this for the breast tumors, I accept this, right? And if I do this, at some point I can get into a contour that is similar to what I showed. But that happens in 3D, I cannot draw in 3D. If I start drawing this again and again, making this into, like, like this, I start with uh, a triangle, and for every triangle I make a W, a W or M. And for every one of them I draw a W. But when I do this here, it crosses. I cannot do it in 2D. It could cross. The spicules say of a breast tumor can cross and intersect. But if I draw it here, it will become a mess. So you can draw fractals like this. And at some point, it is a speculated on two. Very regular because I have a geometric room. But if I try to draw a cloud, make a cloud using 
some clay or putty or some mass. <laughs> And then it can be random. You can start with a ball and make this rough and make that rough, lobulate it more and more lobules. You get a cloud or a mountain. And uh, so in your data set, you have to explain or first come up with a hypothesis as to what kind of variations exist that have been observed by the specialists in that domain. And then compute fractal dimensions. If they work, then yeah, you should be happy, but explain why. I, I don't know the data, so I cannot tell you anymore. Did I answer your question or simply? OK. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. It was really interesting, really clear. Um, I'm just curious, when you use the Fourier transform part, you have to define a frequency interval to fit your model, right? Yes. How difficult is that? How dependent yeah. on the Good question. That's uh, that's the problem. For the knee joint sound signals, we tried different ranges and tried to fit. And we could see in some cases the fit was good. In some cases, the fit is not good. We know the range. If we go to very low frequencies, less than 30 hertz, there isn't much there. In fact, we have put a high pass filter at 50 hertz, at not 50, 20 hertz. So there's nothing less than 20 hertz because we put a filter, it could be a little bit, but not much. Uh, on the higher side, we don't know what the higher limit is, but we sample the signal at two kilohertz, so it doesn't have anything beyond one kilohertz. So the range is already limited by data acquisition. Where is that range of linearity? You have to look at the spectra of a number of examples. I cannot tell you that, call a different application, what I always like to do is to look at these examples. So if there are, you have 100 normal signals, 100 abnormal signals, at least give me 10, 20 of each type. Get the pass spectrum and let's sit and look at that. What is the difference? How is it going on a log-log scale? The spectrum I showed was computed from one signal with one Fourier transform. That will give you a lot of noise. There has to be averaging. So if you do some kind of averaging, you get a better spectrum. And then you can see if there is a linear portion. If there is no linear portion, then it is not a fractal. Do something else. Hopefully, there is a part that is linear, and the slope will be that beta factor. And then you can use that for classification. So again, you have to check that if there is a difference statistical analysis, p-value, or area under the ROC curve for separation, or some kind of a classification accuracy. If it gives you at least 70, 80%, then there is something to be happy about. If it is 50, 55%, then just throw it out. So we cannot predict beforehand. But that range, I we have to determine experimentally. There will be some guidance. Where is the range of, what is the range of the sound? It is acoustic, so you could estimate perhaps. I know that the abnormal uh, patients with this abnormality have higher frequency sounds. There is nothing less than 50, 60 hertz, perhaps. It's all from this, from let's say 100 hertz to 300 hertz, 400 hertz. And then you define that. You also could fit mathematically a number of lines and see which range gives you the you see reasonable fit to a number of signals, not just one signal. And then use that range and keep the same range for all of them. You cannot change from one signal to another. And you got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you showed that there are several ways to, to calculate a number for one picture. And you show that there are some correlations to classify them uh, the four classes. Okay. And it seems that there is a correlation among the several ways to calculate, but it's not exact. If you we have a large number of pictures, maybe what you have is not a line, but pulse. So if we, we try to not just one uh, fractal dimension to, 
to classify, but to, to have uh, clusters. Did you have some, some idea or this is possible? Yes. Um, going back to the first question, there could be multiple underlying models of fractal behavior in the image or data set. In, in the case of the breast tumors, one is related to the contours. The other is related to what is inside the contour. Density variation, brightness of grayscale variation. That's breast density, X-ray attenuation coefficient. If you are computing one related to the density variation, texture, and the other, another related to shape roughness, then you have two that are different. Or do you want to use multiple ways of computing the shape roughness using 1D box counting, 2D box counting, 1D ruler, 2D ruler? Maybe not. Of all those methods, we chose one. We put them all in pattern classification. We did many experiments. We compared for data set A fractal dimension using 1D, 2D, ruler, box, and all these other fractal, other shape factors. And they all gave 9, 7, 9, 8 with, a, with our data set, about 0 0.8 with the other data set. When we combined, we got up to 0 0.9, so it's not bad. But one could argue that we should not use all of these together because they're all estimates of the same fractal behavior of the boundary. Now, this is different, this is different, these are all different ways of explaining changes in shape between benign and malignant. So I don't have a problem putting these together because there are completely different views of shape complexity. But all of these are estimating the same fractal behavior of shape. So I did not want to put them together. If I put them, you could argue and tell me that is wrong because they're all uh, correlated. They're estimating the same thing. But you could also simply put them through various pattern classification methods and then let the pattern classifier select. The feature selection algorithm will reject correlated features, right? That is what it is supposed to do. So we put through those features I showed, various classifiers, linear discriminant, quadratic, medial basis function, neural network, and logistic regression for feature selection, stepwise regression for feature selection. And uh, in some cases, we've got ruler 2D, box 2D selected. Do you want to use that? I don't know. It's difficult to argue either way. But in this case, fractional concavity and speculation index were selected. Uh, here, fraction, this is combining all three data sets uh, the fractal dimension using ruler 1D and our other shape factors. Convex deficiency, not ours, but compactness, these two are ours. Fractional concavity, speculation index. And we got 0 0.93. So here only one fractal dimension was selected. In most of them, only one, except here. In this case, two fractal dimension estimates were selected. But I would argue perhaps you would also argue that those two uh, might not be best put together. If they work together for this data set, will they work for another data set? No. If they work for a bigger data set, no, they didn't come up. Only one came up. So, uh, but if I bring texture roughness, if I bring edge sharpness measure, which I did not talk about today, if I bring other aspects of texture, then perhaps some of these will be thrown out and they will be selected. And we have done experiments like that in other works, not in this study. But this was, the focus here was on shape analysis. Is that? Yes. That's is that what you meant? That's what I, I, I'm trying to, to understand. Okay. We use so many shape factors, perhaps we don't need. If we have good uh, attributes related to texture and sharpness, 
some of these will get thrown out and they will come in. Sure, sure. That's in the context of architectural distortion. Uh -huh. uh, I may not have the actual list of features selected, but uh, we have done such work using many features, 80, 85 features, and then put them through classifiers for architectural distortion, the pattern I showed with the angular spread. So if you measure angular spread, that's completely different, it's not fractal, not shape. That would be useful for architectural distortion, not for masses. So depending on the characteristic of the object or the diagnostic pattern you want to classify, you would need to define or design different attributes. Now I'm, I have retired, I'm a professor emeritus, so I'm old and I'm classical. So this is classical image processing for those of you, the younger researchers here. Nowadays it's common to use uh, deep learning and convolutional neural networks and so you put the entire image and say, you find out. But I like to design these features with this understanding. So for your data set, if you dump it into a neural network, it will do something, but it may be hard to explain. Whereas if you look at that and say, I see this pattern, I will design this measure, and then that might work better than even deep learning. Or if you put that into deep learning, you may get better results than putting the raw data in. So some of some element of our own intelligence and design should go into the process. I was wondering um, just about deep learning because now it is in fashion. Every, everyone is talking about uh, classifying images in deep learning and so on. Uh, if uh, have you had the opportunity to compare uh, the results of the, uh, this uh, fractal uh, classification with other techniques like deep No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Paula and I, we talk about this a lot. Uh -huh. As you said, deep learning is the current fashion. Yes. I retired six years ago. Deep learning was coming new then. Mm -hmm. By that time, I already retired. So, <laughs> no, I have not done work on yes, deep yes. learning. But I have done some work on neural networks when neural networks were the fashion. Mm -hmm. And we did radial basis function and committee of neural networks and so on. Uh, so no, but I have we have compared different types of attributes that we have designed for texture, shape, mm -hmm. edge sharpness. These are attributes that are described by the radiologist. So we asked the radiologist, what is the difference between this and that? And in collaboration with the radiologist, that's how we design fractional concavity speculation index. The equations look simple, but it took a lot of investigation for us to arrive at that. And that had not been done before. Why? I don't know. Uh, will deep learning show that? I don't know. I have not done that. We have used neural networks, yes, but we said we will not put the entire signal. We have seen papers where the whole image or signal will be put into the neural network and it comes with some classification. We said no. We will extract the features, we design the features, we take these design attributes and use the neural network only as a classifier. Because the classifier required for this application may not be linear, quadratic, is it third order, fourth order, I don't know. So a neural network will help us. I'm okay with that. So I was one other thing, just for fun, uh, you said fashion, so I, we were coming, driving in, and there was a big picture of uh, some men's clothing. It said moda. Moda is current for mode, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Fashion. So one guy was like this in a nice uh, suit and tie, and so on. I said, Yeah, that is fashion. And also in the other part, they showed a guy with shorts and t shirts. That's that's what we use. I also I also use that when I go to a beach. Yes, but is that fashion? If you put the two side by side, <laughs> the things. <laughs> yeah, I I like to go like that to the beach. But will I come here to give my lecture? No, never. <laughs> so fashion changes. 
one side at a time. And the context too. Context is important. If I go like this to the beach, <laughs> people will laugh at me. Yeah. So because I think that is so fascinating because we have the summar summarization of things in one measurement, and you don't need uh, heavy artillery in terms of computing power for doing that, and we need it for artillery. So we have so many advantages on using this kind of uh, features mm -hmm. to describe the images. And people uh, many times go for the fashion. I think that is all. Uh, and that is possible uh, only because of the computing power that is available now and the big data set somebody has to put together, right? Otherwise, deep learning will not work. Whereas this kind of design can work for a very specific small data set and if you can reduce the computation to some simple elements, then it'll be faster and you can explain what is happening. So what you do should be explicable. And what in some of the articles I have read, deep learning and neural network based methods could have artificial intelligence in general could have catastrophic failure when you move from one data set to another data set. Whereas when you design like this, when you go from this data set to another, there could be some loss of performance because you designed with some data set that showed you something. The other data set may not have the same attributes. So from 0 0.93, you may come down to 0 0.89, but you won't go to 0 0.2 now. Or 0 0.2, actually, if you reverse it, it will become 0 0.8. So the performance may go down, but it will be gradual. This is what some researchers have shown. Whereas um, methods where there is no underlying model or designed attributes could, and they have shown that they have, such methods have failed, what they call catastrophic failure. So I, I, my preference is this, and but as I said, I'm old and classical. The world is yours now. <laughs> I think that there is a big difference between the both approaches. One, you need to be closer to the radiologists to discuss. So you put the knowledge of the radiologists mm -hmm. inside of the computer, computer computation. The other is the knowledge of the radiologists is there, but in the beginning to build the database. With some good examples, if the database is well done, but it's difficult to have all kind of examples in the database because you have no the interpretation when you use like the learn. So the network will do the will do the interpretation. When we design, the radiologist help us to inter do the interpretation. So it's more general, you know, because. There is already some uh, a filter that is made by our mind. Yeah. Yeah, this is basic. So yeah. finally, the knowledge is there. But to, to work without the initial interpretation, you, you need to read more and more examples. Because you have to catch this knowledge without the, yes. the our interpretation. So because that if it's more, it's more difficult to do the generalization, and if your initial database has no really example for everything, that is quite difficult. When you change to another one, the, the performance probably are going to drop. Um, really. it, uh, it, is, it is nice to have both approaches yeah. that you can go to, together and then we can get the best of both. both. Yes. But I think it's very important to bring the domain expert's knowledge. That's what it is called, the knowledge of the expert of the domain. Whereas if you just use uh, deep learning with a computational model, the expert expertise of the expert of the domain, the radiologist, is not present there. And what Dr. Desertel, our collaborator, described. I think it is safe to say it is not just his opinion, but what has been understood and described by many, many radiologists around the whole world. Everybody has seen that and they describe it. They won't draw the same picture, 
but they say it is speculated, this is rough, this is smooth, that is all over the world, all radiologists know that. So it is that entire knowledge of the domain that comes in, in the design of features like this. And I, I'm thinking, uh, now that you, you compared several fractals, this is ringing in my head. The people from artificial intelligence in the beginning who used to use shallow neural networks, and they had problems to, to have good results. More or less, the same that you, we have it when you try to apply the fractal dimensions theory over data sets, not over images, over data sets. We, are trying, we have some results, but it could be better. Now I'm trying to, 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 to apply the same things that made shallow neural networks to deep neural networks. Maybe we can think about the, a deep fractal analysis. <laughs> so we, you, we can measure the fractal dimension of the fractal distributions. Combine several there are there are papers and theories about multi fractals. Mm -hmm. So objects yes. that have multiple fractal behaviors, and you want to capture all of them. Uh, so yes, it depends on if it is just a contour, a shape. Then it's only shape variation. But if it is a tumor with density variation inside, then it has multiple fractal characteristics. And if there are more that I don't know, it could be, depending on the nature of your data set, there could be multiple phenomena contributing to the complexity of the variations. So if you can, if you can identify each one of them, there could be fractal of this kind, fractal of that kind, and get all of those fractal dimensions and then characterize it as a multi-fractal. Then you may solve the problem in a with a higher level of accuracy and understanding. So there are papers on multi-fractals. Yes. Yes, but what do the, the deep neural networks do? It, it's to have parameters for each slice. Yeah. And process, uh, uh, to make variations of all the parameters. What we do here is to create structure and have these parameters. What the neural network do is every parameter try everyone is going to choose the bad. So mm -hmm. it's very good. We can do that, that for the practice. Mm -hmm. That's the, 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 but how do you guide the neural network to look for this fractal <laughs> behavior? Yeah, this is, is the question how do you design the convolution relationships to look for these multiple types of fractality? in grayscale and shape and so on. By the way, to get the shape and to do the shape analysis, you require detailed contours. Those were drawn by hand by the radiologist with whom we collaborate and no other radiologist will do that. So he said, Dr. Desert said in clinical practice, I never have to do that. I just have to say there is a tumor here, do biopsy. You don't have to draw the boundary to that, to any level of, they say here, <laughs> But to draw a contour like that, and then we have to edit a little bit. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort. You have to come to the lab and on a graphics tablet, go like this, and imagine the difficulty of doing that. Without such detail, the methods may not work. We haven't tested with poorer quality of contours, but uh, it is easy to imagine that if the contours are not of good level of accuracy and detail, you will not get good results. So how do you guide the deep convolutional or other type of neural network to extract, to identify such attributes and extract these measures? I don't know, I have not worked on that, but maybe some methods will come up to do that. This is more of a comment than a question. Uh, but this all this work does have some sort of uh, didactic use as well, right? Like to, I hope so. said, we, you, <laughs> you increment the, uh, the expert's intuition, and it's basically a test to see how rigorous that is or when their intuition fails. So it might be useful for training new radiologists and not just classical. Oh, the other way, you mean 
to train radiologists. Yes, because they uh -huh. take the experts' uh, intuitions that they, they just think is right from the fields of, of expertise and. Uh, and you essentially train the grid, you establish what they actually mean rigorously, and train it with many test cases, and see where the intuition fails, and reincorporate that back into the system of, of training the radio. That's so interesting, but I have not, I have not stepped into their domain to lecture them. Oh, As I've mentioned a few times in my seminars, we engineers we we treat the radiologists as God, and whatever they say, we say that is the truth. Because we have to compare our classification accuracy with what the radiologist said and what the pathologist said, too. Radiologist and pathologist, biopsy by pathologist. But the radiologist does the biopsy sample. The pathologist looks at it and comes up with the diagnosis. We cannot challenge that, but what you say is good. Good in the sense we can go back and say, well, you said this, but look, maybe there's something different. We have done that with our one radiologist colleague who spent a lot of time in our engineering lab. It's difficult to get that, but Paolo has a good radiology collaborator and Dr. Marcelo Nogueira Barbosa, and they share the same office, but in orthopedics. That's fine too. They talk day by day, hour by hour, and even in the evenings over beer. So <laughs> this interaction is very important, back and forth. And with Dr. Desertel too, we had many, many, many sessions discussing in our lab this way and that way. And he would clarify things to us and we would pose questions. But I never questioned what he would say because I don't have any knowledge of that. Sure How he would use problem. to train other radiologists, that's the point you are raising. Well, maybe not explicitly, but implicitly it's, it's refining his intuition. Yeah, but he is 25 years, he was, he passed away. was 25 years or more senior to me. So, but what you say, he could use that to train other radiologists. And I could use this information didactically to give lectures like this and train my graduate students. And yes, certainly this advances the level, our knowledge and uh, our understanding of the problem. And as we do more and more such investigations, we get closer and closer to our destination of improved diagnosis of breast cancer in this case or whatever your aim is in your research work, you will get closer and closer to that aim. But if it is of multiple disciplines, then it is important to have input from the experts of the other domain. How they will use it, it's a good, good observation. Nobody has told me that. Nobody has raised that point as to how they could use it, how we could tell them how to do their job better. I, I'm afraid to step off from well, my... Not exactly in those words. I, yeah, I interpret it that way. As an engineer, I have my box, right? And for me to go and tell them what to do, it's it could be done. There are radiologists who have... now Nowadays, many universities have MD, PhD programs, and they go through multidisciplinary training. Many of them can do this kind of analysis, mathematical computer analysis, and that is how it is advancing. observation that you said, which is very, very important. Because for us, we think that the radiologists, the physicians in general, they follow an algorithm, right? This is our point of view. But this is not what happens, right? Intuition is more yes. important there than algorithm. But for me, years ago, it was, come on, they don't follow the algorithm. But this is our formation. There is this difference. So it is interesting to work together, to collaborate, and to learn. And I think that by by working together, probably they get also from yeah. our way to do the things. But it is talented. Actually, they, they, they seek for this kind of a step by step when we ask for. <laughs> so I was explaining it. So I look at this first, after I do this, I do that. And usually when the, the fellows are in the beginning, the training, this is more like this. But after they are prepared, they are like, just look. There is no this kind of uh, follow the, the flux of that. That is, what you mentioned, I want to add a little bit to that. This is 
an algorithm way of working, thinking and working. As engineers and computer scientists, that's what we do. And uh, we have a certain process, mathematical model. We expect things to follow them. Uh, in this case, that is benign, but it is speculated. So if you just show me that, I'll say it is speculated, it is malignant. But the database says it is benign after biopsy. Now for me, that is an outlier in the data set. And when we ask Dr. Desertel, we ask him, why, why is this benign one like this? And why is that malignant one like that? He said, well, they did not read the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> they are not following the rules, right? Not even we sometimes break rules. And, uh, but their way of thinking is different in the sense they will look at not just this, they will look at the mammogram, they'll look at the patient. There is a lot of other information that comes in. We are very narrow here looking at just the picture in two dimensions of the three-dimensional breast tumor and only the contour and maybe grayscale variation in other features that were extracted. I did not talk about them today. But if you just look at this, uh, my algorithm fails, fail, fail. So algorithmic approach has limitations, especially with limited data, limited views, limited data. But the radiologist has a different way of thinking and will have more information. The radiologist doesn't see the patient, but still the physician will see the patient and the patient will give information, other information. And when you put all of that together, then the diagnosis will go in a different way. So there is uh, the other way of thinking where intuition plays, a major role is important, and that is stressed quite often, that in clinical diagnosis and clinical practice, intuition is important. Look at the patient, and if the patient is, I don't know, 25 years old, uh, what's the chance? And nobody has breast cancer. The chance of having breast cancer is low. It's not zero, but low. So like that, you have to take other factors into account. That's a good point. That's a a big part of why this work is important as opposed to developing machine learning and deep learning methods because it's a way to formalize their intuition and to push that faster into the new generations of the radiologists. So this isn't a rigorous way to formalize the intuition of these senior people that you work with. Good, good observation. Any other observational or question? I don't know what the time is. So I think it's time to thank again Professor Hangaya for coming here. It's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all the best in your investigations. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank you.